In the Pembrokeshire landscape, castles like this one are scattered both inland and along the coast. For many hundreds of years after the Norman conquest in the 11th century, the Norman castles that are strung along the coast of southwest Wales were the biggest man-made structures on that coast. They were made of local stone and they tended to merge into the countryside. In fact, they were designed to do so because the men who built them didn't want them to be easily visible from the sea, but they did want them to be in a very good defensive position. And this particular castle, Manor Beer Castle, which is quite near to Tenby, is a very fine example of that. It's found on a tongue of land dividing two small valleys. Look how hard it is to spot the castle from the sea. From the castle ramparts, we've got a magnificent view over the water. Looking westward across Manobir Bay, there on the horizon, about 10 kilometers away, is St. Govan's Head, jutting out into the Bristol Channel. The headland, there bottom left on the map, stands in the middle of a length of coastline here on the far southwest corner of Wales. Well, Manobir happens to be a very good place to start a survey of this South Pembrokeshire coast because there's a cliff top path running almost the whole way round and you can walk for the best part of 260 kilometers around this coast on that path. As you do, you pass cliffs of tremendous variety, every shape, size and color. And there is that variety because the rocks that make up the cliffs are themselves enormously varied. What we're going to do in this program is to examine the coast of southwest Pembrokeshire and see how wind, wave and weather have formed cliffs in two main rock types. First, old red sandstone and then carboniferous limestone. Back here at Manobir Beach, you can see the rocks outcropping. They jut out just above the surface of the sand in a series of tightly packed lines. The rock changes in color, and even from this height, they appear to rise gently away from the sea. These rocks are formed of old red sandstone. On the ground, the details of the old red sandstone are now obvious. Over millions of years, these coarse, sandy materials which form the old red sandstone were deposited by rivers emptying into the sea. Other layers of younger rocks were later deposited over them, but here these have long since been worn away. When this sedimentary rock, that rock which has been deposited underwater, when this rock is first laid down, it's in horizontal layers. But the layers don't always stay like that. If you look at these rocks here, they're not horizontal, they're vertical. In fact, what might have happened is that they could have been squeezed into tight folds, and then the tops of those folds could have been eroded away, worn away, over a considerable period of time, leaving the rocks in a more or less vertical position. This simple diagram shows the vertical bedding planes dividing the rock layers. Millions of years ago, as this reconstruction shows, the cliff would probably have had a steep face like this. But sea, spray and wind all have had their effect on it. As the sea erodes these layers, it attacks at sea level. There's also weathering by spray, especially in Atlantic storms, and there's the effect of strong onshore winds on the upper parts of the cliff face. And finally, there's erosion by running water from streams and from rainwater runoff. And this is how it looks today. In Manobir Bay, the effect of the rock structure, the vertical rock bands, has been the formation of a wide wave-cut platform backed by gently rising cliffs. 
It's the combination of rock type, how hard it is, how solid it is, whether or not it's all of a piece, and the rock structure, the way the layers are bedded, which determines how the sea erodes the detailed features of the coastline. Travelling westward towards St Govan's Head, the rock changes. The old red sandstone is replaced at the surface by carboniferous limestone here at Stackpole Quay. Although the rock type has changed, because these rocks are all sedimentary rocks, we find similar structures. The strata in this limestone is sometimes horizontal and sometimes vertical, although that's rare in this stretch of coast. But just look here at the magnificent vertical strata, the beds rising at an angle of 90 degrees from the sea. On this geology map, you can see the old red sandstone where it appears at the surface, shown by a darker colour. The lighter colour shows the position of the carboniferous limestone. Let's take a close look at the limestone where it outcrops as cliffs just west of St Govan's Head. That's St Govan's Chapel tucked into a cleft in the cliffs. Now, look carefully at these cliffs. Can you identify any differences between these cliffs and the cliffs we've already looked at in Manobia Bay? As you may remember, at Manobia, the rocks were old red sandstone, and there they were standing on end, with the result that the cliffs had a, a rounded, sloping profile down to the sea. Here, the rocks are limestone. They're slightly younger than the old red sandstone, as it happens, but the important thing about these particular rocks is that they're horizontal. You can see the bedding planes, they are horizontal, and they're divided by vertical joints. Which means that when the sea attacks the base of these cliffs, great lumps of the limestone tend to fall away, leaving the cliff face still vertical not sloping, as in the old red sandstone at Manobir Bay. Not sloping, but vertical, as this diagram shows. There isn't a wave-cut platform in front of the cliffs. Instead, the sea is constantly washing against the base of the cliffs or the pile of debris caused by the collapse of the cliff face. Unlike the old red sandstone, the limestone is soluble, and this speeds up erosion. The Coast Guard lookout at St Govan's Head is a reminder of the dangers to shipping along such a coast. A feature of this limestone coast is the fact that it has lots of caves. These caves are at their deepest where vertical joints occur in the rock. Now the sea can work at those vertical joints by hurling boulders at them, widening them, making caves, and pushing those caves ever further and further back inland. This diagram shows how a cave is deepened by the action of compressed air because a wave going into the cave compresses the air already there and that tends to burst the rock so the cave goes further and further back. When it meets a really big vertical joint, a master joint as it's called, rock from that joint starts falling down onto the floor of the cave until all at once the surface collapses and you're left with a blowhole as it's called, like the one in front of me here. This one goes down to connect with a cave that goes out at sea level and believe me, it's a very long way down here. Just listen. And again.
Sometimes the joints are quite small, sometimes they're large. The earth movements that bent, folded and twisted the rocks of this South Pembrokeshire coast, turning them from horizontal to on end or arching them, of course resulted in a lot of faults or fractures in the rock. And where a fault in a rock occurs, it's generally accompanied by a zone of shattered rock, sometimes very narrow, on either side of the fault. And the sea can get at that zone of shattered rock and eat its way along far more easily than if it were going at solid rock. Well, Huntsman's Leap is a classic example of the way the sea has worked at such a fault. From the front of the cliff to the back of the chasm is about 130 or 140 metres long. From top to bottom at low water mark is about 35 metres. And yet so narrow was the zone of shattered rock that at its narrowest point, Huntsman's Leap is less than two metres wide. Sometimes these narrow inlets are caused by the collapse of the roof of the cave joining the blowhole to the sea. The narrow inlet so formed is called a geo. Just as interesting as the narrow inlets are the narrow peninsulas in these cliffs, especially those which have natural tunnels or arches carved through them. These arches are often produced by two caves being eroded on different sides of a headland. The caves finally meet, forming an arch. Four kilometers westward from Huntsman's Leap is a classic example of a natural arch, the Green Bridge of Wales. Approximately 21 meters high, the upper part is level with the cliff top. It juts out to sea as a very narrow feature. Eventually, over thousands or more likely millions of years, the roof of this arch will collapse, as this diagram shows, leaving an isolated pillar of rock which is called a sea stack. Almost alongside the Green Bridge of Wales are the Elegig stacks, or stack rocks as they're also called. They're amongst the best examples of limestone stacks to be found in Britain. They stand just offshore and they're always surrounded by water. Elegig is Welsh for guillemot, and countless guillemots and razor bills have colonized the ledges caused by the horizontal banding of the rock layers. The dramatic cliff scenery, plus the wealth of bird life, attract holiday makers and ornithologists to this stretch of cliff. The area is in a national park, and it's possible to bring cars and coaches to St. Govan's Head and to the cliff head near the stacked rocks. Pembrokeshire coastal path along the limestone cliff tops links these two access points. Although this is part of a national park, you can only use the footpath in the summer on certain days. Look at the level plateau surface, technically described as a penny plane, which was formed by sea action, and then, when the sea level altered, was left obviously high and dry. Well, this has proved to be suitable terrain for large-scale military manoeuvres. Warning signs are posted on access roads through the Castle Martin firing range and red danger flags are hoisted when firing is to take place. The cliff tops are then out of bounds. Holiday makers watch from afar.
the South Pembrokeshire coast, viewed from the air, from the sea, or from the footpath when access is free, is an area of outstanding natural beauty. The two dominant rock types, the old red sandstone and the carboniferous limestone, have been hammered by the pounding seas driven on shore by prevailing westerly winds for millions of years. Throughout man's history, the cliff faces and the cliff heads have remained largely untouched. For the study of wildlife and plants, this is a rich laboratory, and one which many organizations are anxious to save. Today, this coast has to meet the needs of holiday makers and the military as well. And the coast also has to meet the needs of the local people and be a refuge for wildlife. How long will this prehistoric landscape remain unchanged? <laughs> 